and welcome to the Business of Property podcast. I'm Stuart. And I'm Simon. We talk every week about the reality of running property businesses. Simon has a number of buy to lets and runs Patma, which is a leading portfolio management software system and a source of property market insights. Stuart runs a portfolio of co-living properties with a six-figure turnover and also has a property investment consultancy. Now, before we start today's episode, just to let you all know... We are building our email subscriber base and we have a number of people that have joined and once again, thank you to those. Also, we are looking to create what we call a property growth club. Now, we're developing this at the moment and we're going to keep it very limited on numbers. And essentially, it is a mastermind. It will be a mastermind where we hold everyone accountable in the group. Uh, It's going to be about group support. It's going to be about coaching. There will be a requirement to meet a number of times per year, possibly three or four. And the f- there will be a few requirements. The first one is that it is for people that already have investment property. So if you have investment property, it doesn't matter how many, then you could be suitable for the growth club that we are building. And if you are interested, please do just send us an email to show at thebusinessofproperty.com, show at thebusinessofproperty.com, just to let us know that you are interested, just to raise hands. And we are putting that together very soon. So if you are interested, do send us an email. It'll be valuable. It, it will include both Simon and myself. And my personal experience of doing these things is that it does help accelerate our growth in whatever we want to do. Okay. That's the paperwork out of the way. Now on to the subject matter in hand. Simon and I were both speaking about mortgage rates because Simon has just looked at his mortgage rates for property that he has recently bought. And it's not looking great, is it, Simon, on a personal tax perspective? Do you want to just uh, share a little bit more about what you've been looking at? Yep, definitely. So so this isn't actually a property that I've just bought. This is a a property I've had for, for quite a while now. But but these figures are are based on a on a very real property. Uh, I, I do apologise for this this episode being a bit bit number heavy. Please do do bear with me as I as I run through the numbers. But you can also look in the show notes and and find details there if you want to double check any of the numbers or come back to them afterwards. And uh, yeah, as you say, it's it's really not looking great. So I'll I'll, I'll give you some background on, on the property. So as I said, this is this is a real property that, that's in my my portfolio. It's at its last valuation, which was when it was was remortgaged um, last year, was about two hundred eighty thousand. This is a a terrace house in the southeast, and the the mortgage that I currently have on it is one hundred forty five thousand pounds. So this is a, a mortgage that was taken out some while ago when the valuation was lower. And when I I remortgaged it last year, I decided not to try and extract any further capital from it. So I just kept that mortgage as it as it was, and that means that the the mortgage is currently standing at about about fifty two percent, just just under loan to value. So so this is a, a a low mortgage level really, considering sort of standard buy to let, which which this is it's a standard buy to let property. So considering typical mortgages would be 75%-ish loan to value. So 52% is, is low for... Yeah, I'd capacity. say you know, in the, in the world of buy-to-lets, 50%, in my opinion, is as low as you'd want to go if we're, if we're looking to build property portfolios any lower than that. Then you're probably not maximizing or, or utilizing the cash that you may or might have available. Well, you say that. But but I'm not sure you you would stick with that that argument when you when we get to the end of these numbers, because well, well we obviously want to to try and extract as much cash as we can and and recycle it and put it into new deals. There, there does come a limit where we're doing that just doesn't doesn't work so well. Okay, so to carry on with the the, the background picture for this property, it, it is is rented out. It has been rented out for for quite a while. Obviously, the the tenants change now and then, but generally speaking, it's. They're long-term lets, and the, the tenants are fairly stable. The, the current rent is a thousand pounds per month, and that that has been increased. That was increased last year, just 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 a little bit. Now, prior to the remortgage that I did last year, this property was on a a five-year fix from obviously about five years prior, and the interest rate on that was two point six nine percent. 
So it, it wasn't taken out at the, the sort of bottom of the mortgage market. There were periods when, when you could have got better than that, but it but it wasn't wasn't a bad mortgage by any any means. Based on that that interest rate, I was paying a, a monthly interest amount of three hundred and twenty seven pounds. And and you might see sort of where where we're going with this discussion as I give the next next couple of numbers. But that meant that give or take, and I'm using a a, a static sort of general expenses cost in all of these calculations rather than as sort of picking any particular year because I, I wanted them to all be the same across these these calculations. So the, the the general expenses are consistent across all these calculations. It's only the mortgage expense that changes. So so based on that, it gives a, a pre tax profit, so so sort of cash that you've got left at the end of the year of six thousand two hundred and eighty seven pounds. So that, that that sounds good. I, I think everyone be be fairly fairly happy with that. I, I am, however, uh, will, willing to admit that I am a, a 40% tax rate payer. And that means that when you work out the amount of cash I get to keep after tax, it's only £2,990. So, so already, that's quite a big haircut off the, off the initial profit. And indeed, that works out as a, a sort of nominal tax rate of, of about 52%. So it's quite a, a scary tax rate on on simple buy to let earnings there. So the the next step in this journey was was a remortgage. I had to do this. the The five year fix was coming to an end. I, I didn't choose to do it early. I didn't pay any early redemption fees or anything like that. I did decide to stick with the the same lender and just move it on to a, a new product. So I didn't have any any fees as part of that process. And that was also part of why I, I didn't extend the, the borrowing at all. I did apply for this mortgage a few months prior to the expiry date of the previous fix in order to try and get a slightly better rate because the rates were, were already on their way up and uh, I had missed the, the best time. But thankfully, I, I wasn't at the worst time. So So the rate I managed to get in my my new five year fix was three point three four percent, and this resulted in a, or has resulted, is resulting in a, a monthly mortgage interest payment of four hundred and five pounds, so uh, an extra seventy quid or so on the the previous monthly expense there, so that takes the 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 pre tax profit down from six thousand two hundred eighty seven pounds to five thousand. Three hundred and forty-two pounds, a difference of nine hundred and forty-five pounds across the year, and then after tax, that took the the actual money that I got to keep down to two thousand two hundred and thirty-three pounds. So there is still still a little bit of relief for the for the extra interest, but but not not very much, and that pushed the the effective tax rate that I was paying on this property up to fifty-eight percent. So it's it's a very high effective tax rate, way more than the the sort of headline forty percent tax rate for for that that income bracket. Yeah, which is what happens when we we have costs which aren't allowable as costs. It's uh, it's inevitable that the the tax rate will go up, and it's quite staggering to see that in numbers. But it's uh, but it could have been a lot worse. Which brings us on to the uh, the next line in this spreadsheet. <laughs> now, the, the first two lines were, were real. That, that's what's actually happened. The, this third line is imaginary, if you like, but it is looking at the the real market as it stands today. And I've done a, a little bit of research. I, I haven't spoken to a broker. I haven't hunted down the best deal possible, but but I have done a bit of research and I have looked at the, the sort of mortgages that would be available today. And and this is for me. So I'm I'm a portfolio landlord, which which means I don't get the the best rates that are out there anyway. And I I think I should be able to get a, a mortgage interest rate of five point two nine percent is the the best one that I've sort of seen in my limited research. Now that that's almost two percent more than than what I was able to secure last year, and going on for three percent more than, than the original rate I was on prior to that. Now this results in mortgage interest 
of £641 per month. Now, this cuts the pre-tax profit all the way down to £2,505 for a year. Now, if the boiler in that house was to go and need replacing, replacing a boiler costs in the region of £2,000 these days. So if, if that happened in a year, that would be all of that profit gone before anything else happens. So that, that's really quite scarily close margins, I think. And, and indeed, it, it's a difference of three and a half thousand pounds, or three three thousand seven hundred and eighty-two pounds from the the original profit I was seeing a couple of years ago. But the the best, as in comically worse, part of this is that when you then work out the tax liability on that, my after tax profit would be minus. £36. So I would owe the tax man all of my profit plus an extra £36. So that there is, is no, no profit left in this property at all for me if I was to remortgage today, effectively making my, my tax rate at 101%. <laughs> which, is, which is, well, yeah, yeah. What the hell's going on, Stuart? Well, this is just a, a very real world example of the way the market's going, and this, which is why all of this evidences the sentiment and views that we and others have shared in the last few weeks that the market is going to stagnate, can drop back, because there will be lots of buy to let landlords that would have to go onto these interest rates that clearly are not going to take negative, negative profit. Or stroke loss, or, or or pay the tax man even more than they've earned, because because that just doesn't make sense to anybody. And there's only two ways out of that, which is which is kind of where you're already at, which is the the loan to value must drop dramatically to make this work. And there'll be a number of people that can do that, or they have to sell the properties. And you know, you and I were chatting just before, and I looked at a commercial, commercial and residential property commercial with essentially a masonette above it which i'm quite interested in and you know there's some uh, some vagaries around the commercial element because it's not a popular one with banks however the maximum loan to value they would give me was 65 percent. okay there was a surprise that i could even get a mortgage so that was seen as a bonus however the rate was I think it was 9.9 for a two-year or 10.49% for a five-year fix plus the 2.5%. So on that... This is just ridiculous. Have you been looking at buying brothels again or something? Is, is that why the banks are so, so unhappy about it? <laughs> when, when you say again... <laughs> <laughs> I'll refer people to our earlier episodes... <laughs> It's all recorded. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, and just yeah, just to make that clear, it wasn't that I wanted to buy an existing use building that was a brothel because that is illegal in the UK. It's just that uh, it was being illegally used as such was previously a nunnery, and that's another story that we shouldn't get into here. But the point of that that I was thinking was this is now bridging territory. You know, I looked at bridging finance for something which was between 0.65 and 1% a month. The 10.5, sorry, yeah, the 10.5% rate, the 1049 is essentially the same as I pay on bridge. So it's it's got a bit crazy. And, and obviously, that's a commercial stroke resi. You're, what you're talking about is standard buy to let. And, you know, we, we were looking at some stats earlier from the ONS, which said, yeah, huge swathes of people have already left the buy to let market and that's only going to increase you know as as always you know there, there's there's two aspects to this one that we were talking about means that a lot of people that are doing buy to let can't continue to do buy to let two people are going to have to to look at different areas and you and I talked about the north northeast and, and see you know sell or, or just get out and and the, the only thing I would just complete on the the ONS that I just mentioned uh, according to their study, you know, half of the landlords say it's tougher. I mean, that was that was no news. But 116,000 properties have already left the market due to all of the tough stuff that we've talked about regularly. So this is only going to, I think, you know, accelerate what's going to happen. 
in the market. Yeah, and I think we touched on this before. I mean, the, the part of me thinks, okay, this means that hopefully there's some more stocks going to come on. But as we've just seen, if you're buying in a personal name, it's, it's going to be very tough to make it work. I, I think if you're buying in a, in a limited company as well, buy to let is just really hard to make work at the moment. I mean, yes, you don't have the, the, the extra punitive Section 24 tax hitting you for your, your post-tax. But just looking at that, the, the, the pre-tax drop in, in profit as well. I mean, it's a, a huge drop in profit because of the, the changes in, in interest rates. And y- yes, you can definitely argue the interest rates have been too low for too long. And this is just a, a sort of correction in interest rates. And this is more the, the level they, they should always be at, really. And, and that may well be, be the case. But it's not what we're used to. And it's not what our current property market is, is sort of, or has been based around. And hence, it, it's got to got to filter through to things, and maybe more of these buy to let properties will be sold and purchased by homeowners, or turned into HMOs or service accommodation or or something where where profit levels or profit margins can be a bit higher. But I, I think I think the the buy to let specific market is just in in real trouble at the moment until until things do. To adjust a bit yeah and that, and that was the other option is that okay standard buy to let not working so well however hmo you know when we when we look at the rate that you were talking about 5.29 as i've mentioned before on this podcast that essentially is the rate that i paid for many years on a number of my buy to let said at 85 percent loan to value so 5.29 is something i know personally within my portfolio has worked do i like it no but it, it does work and we still manage to make a profit. Uh, I think something we should do uh, in the near future is have a look at this sort of calculation, but also in a limited company, just to see what the difference is, because the rates may be similar, but obviously having allowable costs makes it makes a big difference to the post-tax revenue that we would be able to uh, accrue into the business. So I think that that is a different, but yeah, as as you said, Vanilla buy to let not working so well. So, what happens to those that you know need need properties to rent? You know, there, there's going to be greater demand. That's going to push rents up, and the thing which the government is trying to mitigate is is going to be pushed quicker because you know it's, it's not that all properties are suddenly going to have fifty percent lopped off their prices because, as we know, you know even the the most pessimistic of businesses or, and banks are, are forecasting 20%. So, and, and you know, we don't, most of us would consider that as a very, very pessimistic outlook. And most of us were, obviously you have predicted a 10% drop year on year to January 24, but and most people are somewhere between that. And, you know, I, I think flat, and but it could be, but certainly not 20. So, but even if that were to happen, would that mean that lots of people that currently rent could afford to buy? Wouldn't have thought so based on the current average price of a property. If we're saying the average is 280 or whatever that number is, obviously, you know, 20% of that's 50K. So it then goes down to 230. You know, in, in, yes, that makes it more, uh, more appealing. But yeah, exactly. Is it really going to move that many people up into being able to afford their own, own home? which is sort of the, the stated aim of these, these government policies, that they do want more people to be homeowners rather than renters. But at the same time, they're sort of saying they're doing lots of these things in order to, to benefit renters. But in actual fact, I think they're, they're really punishing renters and not really helping that many people actually get onto the, the housing market either. Because as you say, it's not shifting the prices very much. And in actual fact, they don't really want house prices and the house, housing market to drop dramatically because that's tied in with so much of the rest of the economy and so much of the rest of sort of the, the value that's stored in, in the country that if they did have a, I don't know, a 50% price crash or something, then that would be a huge headache with, with lots of other knock-on effects. Even if it did mean that, that lots of, of new first-time buyers were, were able to buy, yeah, I suspect the the ramifications in other areas would be more than enough to counter that that extra extra buying power for them. 
So, yeah, it's it's a very tricky, tricky balance to to walk for for the government, and I I do think they they may well be coming down on on pretty much the the worst side of of all of the the balances they're trying to to keep up in the air. Yeah, and let, let's let's be honest with the, the general election due February next year. They're not going to want those things to happen for 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 all of the above and for the general sentiment about the you know the government in charge so yeah they they wouldn't want the uh, the property to crash that far so i i guess it's something we've spoken about before what does that mean to us as investors well it means we've got to keep an eye out we we also have to factor those things in as stress testing as you have and once we get our uh, act together on emails we will start sharing a lot of this useful these useful spreadsheets so that you can run your own calculations and have a look. But the stress test of five and a half percent that we used to work off by to let is now a thing, you know, it is actually the real rates. And so Simon and I were, were basing our calculations just on the 5.3 because that essentially is the stress test rate now. But then you have to take your rental income and times that by 145 percent to, to ensure that you've got that cover. And uh, we, we won't go into that on this podcast, but that these are the sort of calculations we need to do prior to investing now. Yeah, I mean, actually, that, that's a very good point. I, I forgot to mention that. The fact that based on using that that interest rate as the stress rate, in theory, this this 5.29% meets the stress test. And, and yet, while it meets the stress test, it loses money after tax. So how, how is that? meeting some kind of stress test and proving it's affordable for a landlord it's it's crazy i mean yes if you're only paying the basic rate of of income tax as a landlord that then the calculations work out differently and and it is much more affordable but a, a lot of landlords do their, their property as a, a sideline and have another another income that pushes them up the the income brackets or they're doing property as a a business in which case the property is pushing them up the the income brackets so, so yes, I, I, I'm not convinced they those stress tests are really sort of fit for purpose in in the current market. Very interesting to see where where things will go from here, and whether people are are still sort of finding buy to let deals that that can actually work. Yeah, and it does remind me. I remember reading uh, back end of last year, October, that the Mortgage Works was looking at an eight point five percent rental stress test. I don't know where that ended up. Yeah. During during the the madness of the of the Liz Trust period and and subsequent few weeks or months, there there were some some very high stress test rates at that point. But I, but I think mostly they have sort of drifted away again now. So, some mortgages certainly have higher stress rates involved, but yeah, a lot, a lot of them don't seem to anymore. No, well, we hope that you've enjoyed our general talk around what's happening in the property market and Simon's specific example around how the new mortgage interest rates are affecting us as uh, investors. And if you have any comments, thoughts, ideas to share with us, please do reach out. We're on at Biz of Property on Twitter. As mentioned at the start of the episode, you can also email us on show at the business of property. And if you've listened this far, you're surely enjoying this show. So please do leave us at least a rating and potentially a review. Other than that, we'll see you on the next episode. Bye.